Hello and welcome to New People, New Ways, a podcast in partnership with Fresh Expressions Florida and Fresh Expressions United Methodist that explores new ways of being church through the stories and insights of scholars and practitioners alike. I'm Piper Ramsey Sumner, a layperson and cultivator of Fresh Expressions for the Florida Conference. And I'm Michael Adam Beck. I get to hang out with Piper and I am the director of Fresh Expressions Florida and Fresh Expressions UM. And today we're joined by Isaiah and Daniel Park. Isaiah splits her time as pastor between Flores and Restoration United Methodist Church in Northern Virginia, where fresh expressions are being launched and cultivated. For more than two decades, Isaiah has been involved in leading and developing innovative ministry, including church planting. She's passionate about meeting people and doing ministry in unconventional spaces in order to expand the reach of the church. And I have personally seen her at work in that, in some places. Daniel Park is the pastor of Restoration Church in Western Virginia. He's the lead practitioner of Fresh Expressions at Restoration and works actively to mobilize and equip laity to co-create communities of faith that are involved in the well-being of Reston and beyond. I love that. Daniel is a champion of partnership between restoration and community organizations, and he believes transforming communities for good is never a solo act, but it involves partnerships, friendships, and many other relationships that are organic and authentic. Daniel and Isaiah are blessed with four children, and there is never a dull or quiet moment in their home. Amen. And I know that life. (laughs) Welcome. Welcome. Yes. Thanks for being here. Yes, good. I know you said it's hot in um, Virginia, and Michael and I were giving you a hard time about <laughs> what does hot even mean to somebody. You know, we're here in Florida. Ninety degrees is a pretty good day. <laughs> mm-hmm. But welcome. Thanks for being here. So, our for opening question: Since we have two guests, it's a two-parter. So you guys can do it, I guess, in order. So um, who is Isaiah Park and who is Daniel Park? I'm Isaiah. (laughs) And um, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Um, Yeah, so I've been in ministry for many, 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 many years. um, But in terms of being called to ministry, um, I've been in ministry for about uh, three years now. Yeah. And uh, when people ask me out in the community, what do you do? I tell them I'm a story collector, a storyteller, and a story connector. Um, because I, I really feel like my calling, but also the work of God in this world, is that it's part of God's story and what God is doing and what God is unfolding. And so I feel like all of this is a big story. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I do in ministry, but also out in the community. And I'm Daniel Park. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, between Isaiah and myself, yes, we do have four kids. I always say that it's an intersection of adventure and chaos every single day. <laughs> but that's our life. And in the midst of that, I am a pastor at Restoration Church. Uh, I, I felt called to pastoral ministry when I was in high school and uh, was on track to do all of that. But I think it's it's been a real adventure in discovering how um, pastoral ministry at the end of all of it is really about how we can unveil um, Jesus Christ in a really meaningful, life-changing way to to people, especially new people, not just those who are already in the church. And I look back, I've been doing this now for um, more than 20 years, and um, I, I feel like the space is, you know, you know, ministry can look different in so many different ways. But I feel like the space that has really compelled me and, and drawn me is the space of, of, of um, helping people discover Christ and new people discover Christ, whether that's in the form of church planting or, or navigating an inherited church in some way. Uh, that's just been an exciting journey for me. Yeah. So cool. So when did you all first hear this idea of fresh expressions of church? And what, what did you think at first when you heard about it? Well... I first heard that phrase, fresh expression, when I first met you, Michael. It was, uh, I, think, I think it was 2019, was it? I was part of this year-long leadership cohort in Virginia Conference. And uh, it's you meet every month with a group of other folks. 
comes in every every month. And, and Michael was was one of the, the speakers there. And, and I read the book um, Deep Roots, Wild Branches. And so in reading that, it was it was really eye opening. It was very insightful. Um, you know, it, what I found um, really drawing me was the fact that at that time I was actually studying with Leonard Sweet. And I discovered that Michael, you were studying with Leonard Sweet, and that was just like this 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 connection that I made. And and for me, it, uh, you know, the, what kept me in the Methodist Church when I was in seminary during during my master's program, at, way before that, um, was was Leonard Sweet. So I went back to do my doctorate of ministry with Leonard Sweet, and um, and so being in that space of who Leonard Sweet has been in my life, and then meeting someone else who's also studying um, with him was just a feeling of a kindred spirit right there. And then reading uh, about fresh expressions, hearing and learning about that, just started to connect with the stuff that really resonates with me. So, so a lot of curiosity, a lot of fascination, but also connecting with things. I, re I realized, wait a minute, you know, I, I've been doing some of this stuff just without the without naming it fresh expressions and not understanding all the mechanisms around it. But I remember when Isaiah and I were planting a church many years ago, we were exploring doing new ch church in new ways and new places and, and really outside of the box thinking. Um, so it really resonated with me. So good. I, I just got a, um, an encouraging email from our, our mentor just yesterday, actually just sending me a shout out and saying, oh. you know, keep, keep going with it. But yeah. yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. What a gift we've had. Okay. Isaiah. So I think, um, for me, it's scripture, right? Like when I think of fresh expressions, the idea of fresh expressions, I think of Jesus being the fresh expression of God's love to the world and that incarnational ministry, right? So that's where I think I, I first, you know, understood. But in terms of um, fresh expressions, it was from him. I heard it from him about, you know, a, year, a little bit over a year ago. And he was like, hey, you know, you should, you know, look into this. And um, I'm really excited about this. You know, what do you think? And he started sharing with me. And he's like, there's this guy named Michael Beck. And, you know, on and on. And I just kind of looked at him and I was like, okay, sure. You know, uh, because he's always used to like, you know, bringing like these new hot topics and new, you know, new ways of doing ministry. So I was like, okay, okay, okay. And I really didn't look into it. I'll be honest. Um, and then I think I, you know, I, I met you, Michael, at um, the Leadership Institute at, at the Church of the Resurrection last year, and I attended your seminar. And by the way, I actually was supposed to attend another seminar, but I went to yours. <laughs> Yay. And I have to admit, it was literally like a couple minutes in, I knew right away, I was like, yes, this is it. This is it. We're putting a name to a lot of the things that people I believe um, have been already doing and have been really kind of thinking about and already in that space. And we're just now putting a name to it, fresh expressions, right? And so um, I was sold, you know, a couple minutes in and I think yes. it's, <laughs> it worked. Um, but I really feel like that's, that's where I see a lot of um, ways that, you know, if it's like a tree where the branches is just reaching out, right? And the Holy Spirit is moving and it's stretching us and it's it's really causing us to be curious to go out. And so I'm really fascinated by fresh expressions. And so that's why I'm getting my doctor of ministry at United <laughs> for fresh expressions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> shout out, shout out to United Fresh Expressions House of Studies. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you two in some way have basically always done fresh expressions, some version of it. And, and like me, when I heard, oh, there's a whole movement in a language and there's other people that think like we do. So we're not, we're crazy, but we're not bad crazy. <laughs> like we're, the fact that we care about people outside the church and how we're not reaching them, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Find your kindred spirits, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I bet there's a lot of that in those in those classes with the, in the house of study. A lot of people are like, "Oh, I'm not the only one," mm -hmm. you know, out here. People mm -hmm. call me wacky, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. Oh, so I want to know a little bit more about your church restoration because you have so many fresh expressions coming out of it, um, and it seems like a like a very like vibrant community that is very much doing a lot of what fresh expressions is about, which is reaching people 
today and reaching them where they're at that fits in our kind of in the 21st century. So mm -hmm. um, with restoration, your kind of vision kind of statement thing is one church for all. So yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. What does that mean to you? And why was that an important distinction for your church to say that? Yeah. Um, one Church for All is is really important to Restoration um, and to Flores. Uh, Restoration is the second site to Flores United Methodist Church. Uh, and uh, the history, a little history behind that is uh, after the 2019 Special General Conference of the United Methodist Church, Bishop Tom Berlin, who was the then lead pastor of Flores, um, came back from General Conference and uh, Flores and Restoration was really in that space of expanding what it meant, defining who is part of the church and um, how to really uh, be a vital church that connects with the whole community. I mean, the vision statement is we choose to be a vital Christ-centered church for all people in our community. And so with that as being the story that Flores and Restoration had been on for many years, especially Flores has is, it's been around for almost 140 years. It's just that's just been part of their DNA of, and I think uh, what what um, Bishop Berlin would say often is that uh, the story of Flores is that the Flores would see themselves as um, the church is the center of the community and Christ is the center of the church, mm -hmm. and so they've always seen themselves as as people enter into the space of the church that they're like a circle where you let go of your hands and you grab the hands of the new person and you keep expanding the circle. Uh, so that's just been part of the story all along. So as Bishop Berlin's coming back to uh, Flores after the, the general conference results, what's on his heart is what do I do as a pastor to help lead this church forward and not be um, feeling defeated or deflated anyway, but feeling like we're still committed to the inclusion of all people. And so he worked with the clergy at that time, staff, uh, church council, and created this idea called One Church for All, which really was partially about LGBTQ uh, inclusion, but it was really recognizing that the church is really not only about that, but about all the different identity markets, social identities that we all have, that Christ is truly for all. And so that's been in place since then. Um, when I came on board in 2021 to be the pastor of restoration, that was actually a very important thing that was shared with me saying, Hey, this is this is our DNA. This is who we are, and, and and we really want to know where you fit into that and how you feel about that. And you know, hands down, it's like yes, absolutely. Because for me, is uh, one church for all means it, we say all ethnicities, all abilities, all identities, and all orientations. For mm -hmm. me, I think I immediately think about my ethnicity. Um, I'm Korean descent. I think about the story of how my my family uh, came to faith in Christ. Um, I mean, the Korean church as a whole in Korea, and then of course the Korean American uh, immigrant church too. But um, it was a Methodist missionary by the name of Kate Cooper who, who found it in her heart and calling to leave the safety and the confines of what was all familiar to her to get on a boat and get to the Korean peninsula in the early 1900s to say, I'm gonna give my life and, and invest my whole life into uh, making disciples of Jesus Christ in Korea. Uh, and, and my great grandmother became a Christian through her, through Methodist mm -hmm. missionaries. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of that, that at some point in time, somebody thought that Koreans should be included uh, into the gospel story. Um, so when I think about One Church for All, it's like, well, I got included at some point. What makes me be in any space to say that someone's in or out? Like, it makes all the sense in the world to me that... Um, that if I got included, so should everybody else. It's, it's like a no brainer in a sense. Um, and so uh, when I think about One Church for All and all that it really encompasses, uh, it's very personal to me. It's, I get to be part of this and so do the rest of you. So we talk about that in the life of the church as well, especially when we serve Holy Communion and we, we, we preach the gospel every Sunday and say, you know, this is for everyone. Everyone's invited. All are open to the table, are, are, are invited to the table. So, mm. yeah. Mm. So good. Give us a snapshot of um, like what what restoration looks like right now. Like if someone was to come and visit, what kind of people would they see? Um, and it, is, it, is restoration a different um, kind of culture and a different group of people than uh, florists or, or are they kind of similar culturally? There are certain things that are similar, like we share like some of the same vision, DNA, um, some of our programs, like they look alike in, in those ways. Um, but I mean, restoration was started to reach people who wouldn't come into the traditional church. 
And so from the beginning, we started in a school. Uh, if you come to a Sunday service, that's not the only way we gather, but if you do come to a Sunday worship service, you'll find um, an increasing amount of diversity. I think in the last year and a half, we've seen more growth in uh, racial and ethnic diversity, um, and not only in participation, like sitting in the seats and, and worshiping, but in leadership, staff. I mean, it's very visible. Like what we when we say one church for all and we say all ethnicities, we are really seeing that happen. Um, and, um, you know, not happening in the space of tokenism either. It's happening in the space of really seeing families and people of all ages. That's another thing. Like the growth is happening across. And I was just in a meeting last night talking about where are we and where are we headed and, and such and saying, where's the growth happening for restoration right now? Is there a particular demographic? And I said, well, if you really look at it, it's happening across young adults, families and empty nesters. It's just happening. Mm -hmm pretty evenly. And, and that's what's fascinating about this. Mm. Uh, whatever age you are, I've, I'm discovering people feel like they're welcome. Um, whatever ethnicity or background you have, whatever abilities you have, we have people of different abilities, not only attending, again, we see them helping lead worship, um, for an example. Um, so that's that's what's happening. The other thing is we've got folks who have either uh, experienced church trauma, people who uh, who have a background in the Catholic Church or the Evangelical Church, uh, lifelong Methodists. We have a whole diversity around um, different expressions of religion and Christianity as well, coming coming to this church and, and discovering Christ and growing in their faith. Um, but that's just, I'm only talking about Sunday worship. We, we've launched a couple of fresh expressions and we're seeing uh, diversity in those spaces as well. Um, and, and that's happening outside of Sundays too. Cool. So yeah, tell, I love how just the diversity, the, the, the age wise ethnicity, um, just, uh, religious, every kind of category, but so talk to us about some of those fresh expressions emerging from restoration and talk, tell us about some big successes, like some really cool God things that have happened, but also have there any, been any big failures you've had to learn from? Yeah, you know, one real like God thing that happened is the start of theology on tap. Um, you know, we, you might have you hear it in different ways, like pub church, brew theology. We, it used to be called poor theology in the past. Um, but I had a problem with poor theology because when I would say poor theology, we, we meant to like poor. <laughs> it, people would say, what, what do you mean by poor? Like as in like bad theology or <laughs> theology on poverty? Like, what are you talking about? So we're like, let's let's get rid of that title. Um, and, and so Theology on Tap was, was something that we brought back. Uh, Restoration had it pre-COVID. But we brought this back. And the way it came back was, I think this is the God thing. Uh, I was at a networking event with a co community partner organization. And um, the, the brew house owners actually came to me and said, we really want Restoration Church to do something at our brew house. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they extended the invitation to us to create something that builds community that is also reflective of who we are as a church. Um, and that's fascinating because, because the brew house owners, they don't identify as Christ followers. They don't attend church. They just love, they, they see what we're doing in the community. Mm -hmm. um, the, the brew house is in this area called Lake Ann, which is a very active, vibrant community, center, a very central to Reston. A lot of events happen there. We're always there doing things, community service, but also participating in all kinds of events. And uh, the brew house is also a real significant partner in those events too. And after observing us for a while, they're like, we want you to do something here with us. And so they became our person of peace in the community mm -hmm. and they started to advocate and advertise mm -hmm. theology on tap on all their communication channels too. So that's, that's a total God thing happening. The other thing is uh, we have a lay person who then said, I wanna help lead this. So it, it took it off of my hands and it overnight became a lay led thing, um, which is important. And um, so we started, we launched, we started uh, and we have, uh, we always have a speaker come and talk about some topic that is the intersection of something relevant and faith. And it's dialogical because after only 15 minutes of talking, then the rest is all conversational. And then we conclude with a Q and A with the speaker. I get involved in that space too with the Q and A. It's, it's, it's baked into in, with prayer, beginning, ending with prayer. We've also gotten to a point now where it's growing um, and we're getting new people uh, coming back 
um, return folks. And, and we're able to also start exploring other things that restoration is doing and to share that with this Theology on Tap community. Um, and, and, and there are people who only come to Theology on Tap, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and, and identifying that as that's church for me. Uh, so so that, that's, I would say, a, a real God thing happening. Um, I, I think the, the space in which we really had to have to learn and struggling and, and having some real growing edge is um, in our, some of our other efforts, uh, especially like Restoration Cinema, which is this, we got really inspired along with the Chosen uh, season four that got released. We're saying, yeah, let's, let's do this. Again, the, the positive thing was that it was lay led. I had a lay person I was having breakfast with and it was all his ideas. Like, we got to do this. We're going to launch a movie church and we're going to get together at a theater. We're going to invite friends and we're going to do this whole thing. And people are going to encounter Jesus through, through a, a, a movie church, through watching Chosen. Um, and we just dove right into it. We dove deep into it. But what we learned from it is the importance of some things need to take some time to build collaboration and more buy-in from other lay people to be able to have sustainability to it. Mm -hmm. um, as we were watching, they came out in three installments. Each time we saw a decrease in engagement and it started to, we started asking the question, okay, where, what is different between this and theology on tap and what do we need to learn and do things differently? So we're in that space of rethinking that one um, and of, of our strategy around it, not to stop doing it, but to think about, okay, how, how are we going to do this one differently now? Hmm. There's so much wisdom and learning in that. Um, to, to, for, for our listeners who maybe have never heard of the person of peace concept, where does that come from? Um, and then how do you, how, what does that look like in the 21st century? Tell us where it comes from first century and then 21st century. Uh, well, when I think of person of peace in the Bible, I, I think of how Paul met Lydia, um, in Philippi. I think about how even Jesus sent his disciples out to, two by two, and you try to find a house that will bless you, or, you know, you, you want to find someone in the community that will actually be your ad, you know, a partner with you, an advocate with you, and how important that is to the mission, um, that, that Christ sends us on. I think, um, just the same as it was in first century, uh, it is still today. It may look a little different, but it's, it's, it's for us to identify, and discover someone who's connected into the community that's going to be a champion with you. Uh, I think, at least in my upbringing in the church, we lost that mm -hmm. uh, because it all became very insular about what the church can do and only what the church can do. And the church has all the answers and everything. But what I'm discovering is that there's a richness and abundance to the wisdom, um, connections, relationships, resources that all exist in the community already that God has this big heart for as well. And, and, and I'm discovering that if I would just lean into the Holy Spirit, that God will send people to be your advocate and be there with you to help advance uh, the mission with you. Nice. That's good. I feel like the church is oftentimes seen as kind of closed off. Um, and um, for example, the current high school that we worship at, South Lakes High School, um, people were really skeptical of restoration coming in and worshiping in that space um, because we're a church, you know, and we have an agenda and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we want to try to convert people, you know, things right. like that, right? And so it took years to build relationship with even the principal and, you know, um, and, and serving that immediate community to show that we're not a church with this agenda to just get our way, right? But really we're a church that really wants to love and share in that one church for all, right? And serve the community and really display the love of, of Christ. And so it took years to, to build that relationship. And then the principle for us became that person of peace, yeah. right? And then um, when the time was just, you know, right, our, uh, our church, uh, Sunday worship, we moved from one location to another for various reasons, and they were ready. Initially, they, they were kind of skeptical, but when the timing was right, they just with open arms said, hey, you know, come. We would love for you to be part of our school community and our immediate neighborhood um, because we believe that restoration can really do some 
great work um, in a neighborhood in the community. So I feel like sometimes it takes time to build that relationship um, yeah. and for the church not to just have this agenda, but really to build um, a relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, Isaiah, if you could talk more about, you talk about like how stories are really important and part of how your ministry. So do you see that with um, with fresh expressions and then also with how you work with the community, finding those needs and finding maybe through the story, like how does how does that work with your ministry and with some of the innovation and things that you do? So... I learned um, early on in ministry that um, we don't just address people's needs um, because, you know, we see uh, food insecurity, right? And, and people living in poverty. And so it's like, okay, how can I help, right? And we get excited about that. But I've learned early on in ministry that that's not our starting point. Our starting point is to become friends with people, build relationships right? And hear their stories. Yeah. Who are they? Yeah. Right? Who are the people? Where have they been? And who are they now? Right? And what are their hopes and their dreams? And so when you sit with people, um, and you really get to know who they are, then you'll learn about their needs, right? Then you'll start hearing about the needs. And I think that's where the ministry happens is in the intersection of people's stories, and our story as well, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So we don't start with simply just a need that needs to be, you know, fulfilled or, or, or something that needs to be done, but we meet the people. Um, we meet them where they are. Um, we hear their stories. And, and I think that's where the spirit really works in the midst of that. And so even in Fresh Expressions, it's not just about, hey, how do we reach new people? Right. Um, that inevitably just happens when you're passionate about people's stories, people's lives, you know, who they are, uh, where they've been and what has impacted their lives to be who they are today. Um, when you hear about their passions and then connecting that with your passions, um, I think that's that's at the heart of Fresh Expressions, right? Because that's, that's the heart of Jesus for us and why Christ came for us. It's not simply just, hey, you're sinners and you're bad people, so let me come and save you. I think... I think salvation um, inevitably happens because Christ comes to be with the people and to remind us of who we are. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think stories are a big part of our mm -hmm. fresh expressions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like it's at the heart of it. Yeah, it really kind of um, removes the whole transactional nature of the gospel narrative. You know, that is like, People bring a lot of assumptions to church saying, oh, it's just transactional. God did this for me, so now I do this for God. Or, you know, if I go to church, they're just going to ask me to do stuff. Or if I go to church, they're going to ask me for my money. And just everything is, 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 is framed in a very transactional way. But what you're talking about is um, stories. Is Stories are everything. That Our lives are story. The gospel is story. And um, mm. stories stories are, are not all polished either. Stories get messy. Um, yeah. And, and the gospel is messy, too. So when we really live into that space of story, we're discovering that in Fresh Expressions especially, it allows for story to really be front and center to, yeah. to all of that. Yeah. And I think it also takes time. I think sometimes when we talk about Fresh Expressions, they go, okay, so Fresh Expressions is going to, like, grow the church, you know, and do something, <laughs> like, miraculous, right? It's going to be an overnight growth of the church. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, we're building relationship here it takes time you know and, and to your point it's messy mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. it's not polished and there there's a lot of underground work that happens that we don't see oftentimes overnight um and when we do start seeing growth happening it's because of the years of the relationship um and the stories that have been building um mm -hmm. yeah so It's fascinating when you are in that space with community partners and the conversation is not restricted to here's, here's what the organization is trying to do and here's how the church is alongside. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking to some of these folks that represent the community organization, 
and they're opening up to you about their own personal challenges that they're facing, you know you've really broken through a certain wall at that point. And 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 that relationship has now gone really authentic beyond the just the the shared interests of both organizations. Um, real relationship and friendship is starting to be formed. And and we've we've seen things really start to open up when that happens. It's yeah. yeah. really good. It's like my Michael, you feel I feel like you've had similar experiences with um you know like your you you have a church that is has this big network of fresh expressions but part of why it works so well is because it's in the community and it's without the community those fresh expressions wouldn't exist and there would also be no point there's no function to having those without it being an integral kind of part of the community and then what happens people from that see what you're doing come to you and say hey we want to be a part of what you're doing or we want to invite you into our space and so i love hearing um about how restoration with your um, theology on tap, how you got, you were reached out to and said, Hey, join, join us in that. Um, Cause that's a good sign. That means that they see what you're doing and they want to invite you to, to use what their resources that they have, those permission givers. Um, yes. Please. It was also funny. You were saying um, how poor theology, they didn't understand it. That happens with my group called brew theology. I had a, there was a guy at, that worked at a brewery asking, he was like, what is this about? Like the theology, like, religion around like brewing beer and i was like no we just brew theology so could be <laughs> yeah i guess we could i had i found a, a a graphic that showed the progress of like how you brew um beer and it did look a little similar to the fresh expressions journey so i was playing around with that a little bit <laughs> yeah um so good so yeah go ahead michael yeah i was just gonna since we're on that um you know, community partnership kind of uh, space right now. What advice would you give to congregations that are trying to make connections with local nonprofits and community organizations? How do you know how to partner with and like encourage your congregants to, to join in and be part of that? Um, I would actually, even in our conversation just now, is reminded of some of a key piece to all of this before it even gets to the community partnerships, the, the kind of culture and mindset that, that is important to instill in the congregation. Um, I remember a number of years back, I, I was listening to, I was at a workshop and the person leading this workshop asked the group, it was most, mostly clergy and lay leaders and said, if your church were to close doors tomorrow, mm. would, you, would your community care? And that it, it hurt to think about that one. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the congregation would obviously care, but would the community care about that? And so I often bring that up to the leadership, say to the congregation from time to time and say, you know, we're a church that cares about the community. This is really important. Um, now I don't say necessarily to the congregation, like what would happen if we were to close tomorrow? That creates a lot of anxiety. But, um, it, but I think that mindset is important where it's a good measurement a good you know litmus test to really ask does the does the community know that your church loves them and, and cares about the community uh, mm -hmm. i think it starts there that having that mindset is really critical if a church wants to connect with a nonprofit organization you have to ask yourself what's your motive what what is the reason behind it if it's survival um you're just trying to do the next thing or you just want to you know check off on your bucket list you know we're helping the community then I think that's a moment to really, really seriously rethink um, the why. Um, it's, do you, do you see first that God really cares about this community, that God loves the community just as much as God loves the church? Mm -hmm. uh, the church is in the community for God so loved the world, not God so loved just, the, you know, this. You know. And I have trouble even saying saints and Christians now because it's just, that starts to box everything in. And so, but, but point is for God so loved the world. So do we understand that? And, um, and, and, and do we live into that mindset? Cause then if I have that mindset, then when I start engaging with a nonprofit organization, the people there, I will see them as with, with you know, with sacred worth. Uh, mm -hmm. And 
um, and that relationships that we talked about, that's all part of it. That's all important to it. But sometimes we just get into this mode of, um, I want to do something with helping those who have food insecurity. So I just want to hurry up and get programmatic about this. And, and so that, that's, that's something that I would really uh, say that kind of take a step back from that and start creating the relationships first. The other thing is that another thing I've observed and have participated in myself is that when the church starts to think that we have to reinvent the wheel and we have to, we have to like, if we, if we care about food and security, do we suddenly create a food pantry or do we identify a nonprofit organization in the community? They're the pros at this. They, they think about this day and night, every day, um, 365 days a year. This is their thing. What, what makes me think as a pastor um, that my church is going to do a better job than that. It would actually do better if I think about partnering with the organization to mm -hmm. teach us how we can serve. And when we step into the space where the experts are doing it and we partner alongside, not only does that help us achieve our goal better of addressing food insecurity, but it actually puts the church in the community. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love that and it's it's really taking a step away from the church having to be the be all end all of everything um in, in the community i love what you said there and um you know earlier you mentioned paul lydia you know um and meeting down by the river and making those connections relationally and then her house ends up being you know the first church in philippi and right so jesus trained the disciples to be guests you know, go out, Luke 10, two by two, find that person of peace, do life at their table. You're being sent to them and you're you're dependent on their hospitality and you're dependent on the, those relationships um, to open the kingdom possibilities around the table and then healing manifests. And then you can proclaim the kingdom of God has drawn near. And I feel like we've been playing host for so long as the church. Like we own the space. We say when it's going to happen, we're going to speak a language that we decide and music we've chosen in advance. Um, and it's all, you know, come to us and we'll and helping the church shift that mindset. I find that to be one of the greatest challenges in this work because it's easier just default to that into our resources and our stuff and say, come to us. And we're trying to, with fresh expressions, help people learn to be guests again. And I feel like y'all are really doing that in a profound way. And community partnerships are such a huge part of that. And it's not saying, how do we, you know, go do the stuff? It's saying, how do we partner with persons of peace who are already doing the stuff and then create new things together? Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's also, there's a certain theology where, some people think that only God works in the church. Mm. And um, I think God is so much bigger than that. We, and we find that in scripture, you know. Yeah. Um, and when we start to see that God is already at work in the community and out in the world, and the church can partner um, with the good work that God is already doing, um, it's easier for us to make that connection and be like hey we're we're doing a lot of good work together why don't we why don't we partner up you know and um i've talked to a lot of colleagues who are afraid to make those cold calls to community mm -hmm. you know partners and nonprofits and just to say hey you know i'm pastor or i'm you know with this church and i want to know what your organization is about you know i want to know your story you know and i want to know the ways that you all are making an impact so can we connect um, and I think it's sometimes just making that first step mm. and, and calling and, and connecting um, and just getting ourselves out there because we all are doing good work that God is doing through the Holy Spirit. The question is, are we willing to see that connection? Mm. Yeah. Piper, you're muted, I think. Sorry about that, my button. I thought I pushed it. I was gonna say, I think sometimes the church, we, um, we, yeah, try to reinvent the wheel when it's already happening and creating those connections. And I love, I actually think that it's really 
it's probably benefits that restoration doesn't meet in a building that's dedicated just to church um, mm -hmm. because you're naturally going to be connected to this local school um, just no matter what you do. And so that's such an easy way to just continue that partnership and to deepen it and to find ways. How can we help the families that come to the school that send their kids um, and create those connections compared to churches that end up kind of being um you know, kind of end up being up like kind of like in a little castle hidden away, away from their communities. And then they wonder why nobody comes to their church. And it's like, well, no, people sometimes don't even know you're there. I know that people tell those kinds of stories all the time where, and I know that happened in my church growing up, you know, someone would be like, oh yeah, I've lived in this neighborhood 25 years and I didn't know you're here. And it's like, what? We are on this big, like this corner right here. How could you miss, you know? Um, but when you're not a part of the lives of the people that, um, right around you right in your neighborhood um because you're part of the neighborhood and that's something too to to lean into that identity and that can be hard sometimes when um sometimes churches they kind of bust themselves in like they literally don't live where their church is located and they come in church on sunday and then they go back out and so having people think a lot more locally um creates that place where you're like this uh, this is our community let's let's act that way and let's love and care for them that way. Hmm. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a phrase that I learned uh, when, we, when we first came to Restoration Church and it's, it's historic to uh, the, the town of Reston. Um, it's, it's a phrase called live, work and play. And the idea was that the founder of Reston wanted to create a community where you, where you can live, work and play and it would all be accessible to all of that. And I, uh, Restoration Church was started with a idea that church should not be exclusive to a certain day or a venue, but that it would kind of parallel a little bit of um, this idea of live, work, and play. Um, and so that's a little bit part of the DNA. I think I sense that from the people, especially the Restonians. Actually, a lot of the folks who who come to who are part of Restoration who actually live in Reston have a have an understanding of that especially the lifelong restaurants yeah. who've been there for several decades they're like yeah this it, the church isn't just for you know compartmentalized to one part of, the, of your life but it should really be part of everything permeate through everything so mm -hmm. yeah, that we see some of that kind of you know cook, you know blending together it's great yeah so you're you're what some would usually have kind of this inherited hub to work from is a is a communal space you know school mm -hmm. and it seems like you have these fresh expressions kind of spread across the week it can meet you know different times different places so you've expanded the imagination of church where it is involved in working and playing and you know living uh in your daily life mm -hmm. so your church is not just one thing that you come to you know once a week but there's all these little pockets of it and come back to what Isaiah said, I, I do think that we've overemphasized this idea of like church, is the place where God does all the stuff. Right. Um, and and I think what, what I see with y'all's ministry is, you know, where two or more gathered in his name, there he is in the midst and little pockets of church can can yeah. kind of spring up anywhere, anytime with any people. Yeah. And you're like living that out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those first, second, third places, you're happening everywhere like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, here's the question, one of our, our kind of closing ones that we always ask. Um, and I want to, yeah, I definitely want to hear both of you for both of this, a two-part question. So what does the future of the church look like to you and what is your hope? I think um, it's interesting because the word future means forward. And yet when I think about the future of the church, I think about going back to the time of Jesus and the way that Jesus did ministry and how church happened everywhere. Um, it didn't happen just in the synagogue or the temple um, it happened wherever Jesus was. 
mm. um, in the in the marketplace, in people's homes, out in the fields, right before a fire, at, right in front of the shores, you know, in the waters, on a boat. Um, church happened everywhere Jesus was, mm -hmm. and I feel like the future of the church. That for me, I feel like that's where we're headed. Is that instead of the language of "Hey, let's go to church," um, it's we are the church mm. you know? and where the people are like, there is the church. And so when I envision the future of the church, I envision the ministry of Jesus is that wherever the people are and where the people are gathered and where the spirit is moving and at work, like there is the church, yeah. um, you know, in scripture, the, the church is the body of Christ and the body of Christ is not one that's just still, and no movement, but there's movement, there's motion, there's life, there's conversation, there's relationship, right? There's vision and hope and there's new life, right? And so um, when I think of the future of the church, I think of that. I think of movement. I think of motion. I think of hope. I think of transformation and change and connection. And so I know it's future, but I feel like it's to go back to the ministry of Christ. Mm. Um, yeah, and that that's my hope through Fresh Expressions. I feel like Fresh Expressions is really the, the avenue for us to go <laughs> and be. Um, and wherever we are, that's the church. Yeah. I'm hearing um, reclaiming, mm. re reclaiming the, the church that that was intended to be. Um, I'm reminded of Matthew 16, where Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi and says, mm -hmm. who, do you, who do the people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're a Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus then, that's the first time he mentions the church. And he says, you know, I will plant my church on this rock and the gates of Hades will not prevail. And and, you know, it's this idea that the church is at the front lines and, you know, a gate is like, the the perimeter right of, of of a property and you know mm -hmm. churches for so long kind of isolated them the, the church itself uh, away from community away from you know uh, what church has called worldliness whatever you want to say um but the, but that's not jesus's intent it's to be at that front line at the very edge and being in that space where the community can be you know interacting with the church the body of the people um to your point, it's going back. Going forward means going back. Um, just as the the first Methodist movement went back to ancient practices, you know, we're being drawn back to that space again to really think about how can we uh, get back into the roots of who we really are, um, doing church and relationship. I, I think there's still a space for the forms of church we still have inherited that we've inherited. I think that's important as people still think and operate in that way. But I think what will bring vitality and new life back to the church is to re really live into who we who we are and who we've been called to be, which is really getting into the community. Mm -hmm. I think Fresh Expressions does that. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So tell uh, people where can they keep up with you? Where can they follow you? Uh, how how can they learn more about what you're doing? Uh, restorationreston.org is uh, Restoration's website, um, has uh, mostly everything that the church is doing. Um, there is a YouTube page and a Facebook page. Personally, I have a Facebook page that I primarily update a lot of things related to restoration and florist. So that's how to keep up with me. Yeah, same. same. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes so people can find you and connect with you and see what you guys are up to and see, put some, um, some faces and some visuals to the names and the stories that we've given today. So thank you guys so much for being here. This was such a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for being here. And to those who joined um, and are listening, thank you so much for being with us for this episode of New People, New Ways. If you enjoyed our conversation with Isaiah and Daniel, please share it with a friend. 
um, and do the whole rate, review, subscribe, all that stuff. To connect with us and to learn more about Fresh Expressions, you can go to freshexpressionsfl.org and find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. See you next time on New People, New Ways.